Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Dewar, Foster Care Specialist for Maddie's Fund, and my co-host is veterinary behaviorist Dr. Sheila Segerson, the Director of Research for Maddie's Fund. Our topic in this session is marketing pets from foster care, um, but specifically anti-marketing. And um, Finnegan Dowling is our is our guest tonight of Mutual Rescue. She um, was the person behind the Eddie the Terrible blogs and um, is going to tell us a little bit of how, about how to use this tool. Um, during this 30 to 45 minute meetup, we'll be answering questions, listening to your solutions, and hoping, hoping we'll get to see some of your foster pets on camera. And I definitely want to see your foster pets, and I definitely want to hear about any hard cases that you have, because this is a great place to brainstorm and chat about these sorts of things. Um, as, as Kelly said, my name is Finnegan Dowling, and I've worked in shelters and shelter marketing since dinosaurs roamed the earth, or 1997. Um, I've done a lot of shelter marketing. The thing that I'm probably best known for is writing Eddie the Terrible, the Eddie the Terrible campaign, which was a series of Facebook blog, uh, Facebook posts, a blog, and a couple of videos about a dog that had been in care for over, I think, two and a half years um, and had bit several people, not terribly, and needed a very special home. And so we decided that we would go to anti-marketing. And a lot of times the question is, what is anti-marketing? And what anti-marketing is, is when you go in the exact opposite direction of what you see as most shelter marketing. Whereas you're telling everybody, this pet is cute, this pet is wonderful, this pet is adorable. Instead, you're leading with the quirks, but you're doing it in such a heartwarming way um, that you're making an emotional connection and helping people realize that, you know, every pet is, is not um, perfect, neither is every person. As everybody knows, most people's pets are not perfect. When a pet is owned and in a, and in a home, a lot of times we look at its quirks and we look at sort of the strange or not awesome things that it does and we find them really endearing. These are the things that we talk about with our friends. These are the things that we Facebook and social media and, and all of that stuff about. But when an animal is in a shelter, there's an expectation that somehow that animal will be perfect. So the idea behind anti-marketing is to kind of use that same tactic that you do with your friends and your family to show off that sometimes the beauty of a pet is not in its perfection, but in its imperfections. So to effectively anti-market, it has to be funny and heartwarming. And I cannot stress this enough. It does have to be funny. Um, you don't want to throw up stop signs and you want to create something that is enormously shareable. So if you're not sure if something is funny, run it by a coworker, run it by someone that you know that is not an animal shelter social media and say, what was your reaction to this? So must also include positives about the pet and it must create an emotional connection without being cloying. We see a lot of cloying, like very kind of saccharine sweet, very sugary social media look at this poor dog, it loves to cuddle, it loves to snuggle, that sort of thing. You've really got to go outside of the box to anti-market. Um, and you still want to make an emotional connection, but you want to make a really genuine, realistic one. The one that most people have with their pets or with their family or with their kids where they know they're not perfect, but they understand them and love them for that. Um, a very easy way to be funny and to be readable and to be shareable is to use the negative as a hook and then seed the post or the blog or the video with positives. And, you know, always remind people in somewhat of a subtle way, you're not perfect, your pet's not perfect, other pets you've had, this, this animal is just like all of us. It's got a little bit of a flaw, don't we all? No one's perfect. Um, and encourage sharing, because my guess is that if you are here looking to anti-market a quirky or difficult animal, you do understand 
that this isn't going to be the right pet for everybody. So you always want to make sure you include a line that says, let's all get together and see if we can find somebody as strange as Fido, something like that, you know, pass this on to your favorite inter introvert, that sort of thing. You want to encourage sharing without directly asking for it. Um, the reason you don't directly ask for it is the Facebook and, and Instagram and a lot of the social media algorithms really hate asking for a direct share. So you kind of have to sneak that in there somehow. Um, asking for an introvert, asking for a hermit, asking for somebody that lives, you know, like share this with your favorite, you know, person who doesn't mind a dog that barks a lot, that sort of thing. Um, and this was a dog that was a husky that was famous for being incredibly vocal and um, also a fence climber and thus the meme. Uh, I have come to sing you the song of my people loudly. And memes are a great way to anti-market pets that are a little bit dif uh, difficult. Memes are very easy to make. I think it's image flip that I use that you can take any photo, upload it and meme it for free. So it's a really great way to do a, a, some anti-marketing type marketing. So the most popular examples of these, and there's been so many of them that it was really hard to pick. Um, this was Eddie the Terrible. Like I said, he had been in the shelter system for two and a half years. He hated other dogs. He hated children. Um, he refused to sleep anywhere but on a person's bed. He would scream his brains out if he was in a crate or like in a kennel of any sort. He had been successful in foster care with a very quiet foster parent. Um, and so we did a full campaign on him um, that included funny, shareable sort of takes on what was big on social media and what was big in popular culture at the time, adopting bad, nightmare on Ames Avenue, that sort of thing. And then we did a longer blog about why you didn't want to adopt Eddie the Terrible. But seeded into that blog and into a video that went with that package was a lot of things about how loyal he was to his family and how much they loved him. Fun fact, what is it, five years later now, um, Eddie, Eddie was adopted four days after this went up. He wound up on the Today Show. Um, he's been written up all over the place. And in one of the strangest twists of fate, he actually is a service dog for his owner, who is a veteran <laughs> and goes everywhere with him and is absolutely fine. He has a do not pet me, do not touch me vest that he wears when he is out and about and he is living the best life ever. Um, his veterinarian, not so much, but so it goes. So next up is Perdita the cat, which was done. Um, has anybody heard of Perdita? Perdita has an amazing Instagram account now. Perdita was from a small shelter in North Carolina and had been there for a while and was just a jerk, had like bitten, swatted, scratched everybody. And they went completely anti-marketing on Perdita. And I've got the photo. This is only half of the post that they did about Perdita. Um, she, you know, they posted this and went enormously viral. She had 50 applications within four days. And now not only is she adopted, um, I think even the lead, the lead on her page was, we thought she was sick. It turns out she's just a jerk. And then they listed sort of all of these funny things and they followed it up with posts about how we tried to give Perdita treats today because she's so popular and we wanted to give her, you know, something special for being like a special cat. And she swatted the bag out of the person's hand and then stalked off angrily. And they had all of these great photos of Perdita um, that went along with these different posts. And she not only was adopted very quickly, she now has like 
19,000 followers on Instagram or something crazy like that. Because like a lot of pets in the shelter system, once she is in a home, she ceased being a problem pet and started just being someone's beloved quirky pet that they thought was funny. And so that's the point of anti-marketing is to try to appeal to the fact that nobody is perfect. Everybody has flaws. Most people have loved an animal that is deeply imperfect. Ask me about my dog Waylon sometime. I will be happy to tell you. Um, and it, it, it's just a point of reaching out to that. And um, yeah, so that's what anti-marketing is. And again, it can be incredibly successful. Some things to know about it is that if you are going to try it, be prepared for a little bit of pushback. Um, prepare the people that might have to answer any emails or anything like that for what you are doing. Um, but also know that these campaigns do tend to be, when they are done well, um, incredibly successful. There was another one from Australia that I didn't do slides about that was, um, Kelly might remember the name of the cat, but it was like a blog about a foster cat that was just absolutely horrible and hated everybody. And it, it was incredibly popular. And that cat as well, despite being a middle-aged black, somewhat antisocial cat got adopted very quickly. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, we have one here from Claire. She says, I have a foster who's been a challenging one. He is so playful and so snuggly and loving. However, he doesn't get along with one of my dogs and has attacked her, so we have to keep them separate. He also has jumped my six-foot chain, chain link fence and run away. I'm having a hard time because I feel like adopters want a perfect dog. What should she do? Yes, what is a perfect dog? Um, so... If the question is what angle should we go, go would you, should you go with with that? Um, evil canine super genius would probably be my lead phrase because he can get out of a fence. Um, depending on the nature of the attack for resource guarding for affection, um, you know, obsessive canine needs to be your one and only but i really love like the even like when it comes to escape artists um the you know those are dogs that are really smart and really curious and if you say smart and curious a lot of times people are like they're going to destroy everything in my house whereas if you just lead with that they're like oh i had a dog that was like that yeah it happens so tell us what is anti-marketing and what is it not what differentiates it from other types of marketing? Anti-marketing is marketing the animal as is warts and all in a loving fashion and presenting the facts as they are without putting up stop signs. And what I mean by stop signs is it would have been very easy to market, say, Eddie um, or some of the other dogs that I've worked on at, with a post that says, does not like kids, does not like strangers, no cats, like no visitors, that sort of thing. And those, when people hear that, they automatically assume that the animal has done something completely terrible. When in most cases, a lot of times, um, the reasons those restrictions are put on animals are for things that aren't really that bad, um, but they just want to be careful. So you present the facts as they are, but you do it in sort of a loving manner. And you also make sure that you are seeding these posts. You're leading with the negative as a hook. You're using the negative as a hook to get people to, to look at something because it's different, because it's new. And you're also seeding those posts with the positives about the animal. Um, you know, like I, Perdita, there was a lot about incredibly curious, loves to climb, like hysterical to watch, that sort of thing. And, and those things were all very true about that cat. And they were things that most cat owners could relate to. But 
instead of leading, yes, they did lead with the negatives about her, but they did it in such a way that it made you want to hear more about that animal. I noticed that you have like specific details in your posts. How do you think of, of it? I mean, like, like, how do you think of the details that you include? I talk to everybody that's interacted with the animal. It's very easy to read the profile on an animal um, and say, okay, it says no kids, no this, no that. And instead, you need to look at the animal holistically and look at actually what it has done and what it is capable of doing. Um, You know, with a dog that nips at children, you don't say no kids, he hates kids. Um, Though I'm not against using the phrase he hates kids, as some people do as well, you know, to try to rope in that group of people because there are people that just don't have kids and don't want them. It's, but it's grabbing those instances, looking at them, picking them apart and trying to recreate that in your head as if it was your pet and you were telling a funny, but slightly embarrassing story about them. How do you make them funny? Oh boy. Um, (laughs) Uh, how do you make anything funny? Yeah, I read a lot. I spend a lot of time on popular culture and I, I can never, um, really underemphasize the value of popular culture when you're doing anti-marketing. If there is a reality show, if there is a TV program that is blowing up and you have a popular villain oh my gosh, compare the animal to that villain. But um, a lot of popular culture and a lot of just looking at the absurdity of it all. And, you know, animals are absurd. There's been a lot going on lately where because so many people are working from home, um, I've seen a lot of posts on different boards that say, describe your dog um, as your coworker. And, you know, like, what's the worst thing your dog does, but use the word my coworker instead. So like, there's all these funny things like my coworker walks into my office, licks my toes and like falls asleep and snores. And try to think in those terms, like think of it, instead of thinking outside of the box, think outside of the pet, like kind of, you know, anti-marketing One of the things I love about anti-marketing and that I am a huge, huge, huge um, advocate for is returning the dignity to the animal. And what that means and what I mean by that is um, animals are not robots. People are not robots. Um, They're all different and all imperfect, but in the same way, all perfect in their own way. So if you can take it out of the dog or the cat box, and not literally the cat box, leave whatever is in the cat box actually in the cat box, but um, and, and kind of put a different noun on it and then try that sentence again. You know, try how you would describe that behavior if it was your husband, your child, your friend, something like that, and look at it like that and give them the dignity of being an individual that has the rights to, to have likes and di- dislikes as a person would. I have a question. So I love this idea and I'm really, I kind of want to just give it a try because I'm curious to, it just seems like a fun thing to work on. But just thinking about when you have a population of dogs or cats or combination of who are more challenging, how often do you want to use this? Should you use this? Any thoughts around that? Um, anti-marketing is like truffle oil. It can be tempting because when it goes over well, it goes over really well, but then you start seeing it on every single menu and it becomes a little overbearing. It is something that I would say should be used very sparingly and only for animals where you're looking at sort of 
the higher end of the deviant behavior spectrum. And by deviant, I don't mean eating people. I just mean deviant in terms of the cat that everybody's really worked to socialize, but really would rather just be left alone. Um, the dog that is great with one person, but might snip at everybody else, that sort of thing. So it's something that should be used almost as a last resort, somewhat sparingly. And you do have to have a great sense of humor to make it work, which is why I say always run it by people that are not animal people first to say, what do you think of this? And if you don't have access to that, rewrite it and put a person's name in it and send it to somebody and say, this is a description of my cousin. What do you think? When you um, did, wrote the Eddie the Terrible blog and started the campaign, what kinds of pushback did you get and how did you respond to it? You know, when you get into these really quirky animals, and I say this as a person who has a house full of very quirky animals, um, you get into a lot of people that have worked really hard with this animal and really have a lot invested in them and see the absolute best in them. And they don't want, on one hand, they don't want the wrong person to take the animal home and they're aware of the animal's flaws. But on the other hand, they don't want the animal demonized. And so that's a very big obstacle to come up against where you do try to explain that there is an element to this of really giving the animal back their dignity of speaking about them as you would a beloved friend, neighbor, husband, and talking to your audience, be it your social media. And this is especially important for foster parents that are marketing on their own social media pages, where these are people that you do know. You know, these are people, if you're putting this animal out on your own personal social media, and you're giving that animal back its dignity by letting it be an individual, but the pushback can come from two places. It can come from number one, advocates for the animal who are afraid that you are just, you know, being a hater for lack of a better term. Um, and also from just sort of John Q public that says that's mean or that will generalize and say, you're making all chihuahuas sound terrible. You're making all cats sound awful and difficult and that sort of thing. And the thing is, is, you know, I think sometimes in sheltering, we get really hung up on the 98% versus the 2%, where it's very easy with public responses to look at two, you know, if you get a thousand responses that say, this is funny, this is great, this is awesome, um, and you get two responses that say, why are you even adopting this animal out? It doesn't even sound like you like animals. This poor dog, why is it in your care? That sort of thing. It's really hard to put those two responses aside, but you need to. And in looking at some of the anti-marketing campaigns, the Eddies, the Perditas, the amazing Australian cat who I could not find for a slide, um, what you see in the comments, 99% of them will be comments like, oh my God, that's just like my dog or, oh, my cat, my cat would have eaten Perdita for lunch was a category that was like a comment that I saw in one of those posts where it really was a lot of people making that emotional connection, um, uh, this cat reminds me of my husband was another one that I saw, like just that sort of thing. So, you know, and, and that's, but the pushback a lot of times, or it will come from internal sources as well, because there is a fear of, Oh my God, are you saying we adopt out a dog that bites? And, you know, that's a fine line to walk. And that's a case by case basis. Like with Eddie, had he bitten anybody? No, but he sure had tried, you know, but he was also an eight pound dog. Um, so it just really depends on the animal. And I, th I feel like that really 
plays into the balance of wanting to portray shelters as a wonderful place to get pets from while at the same time educating the public and and increasing our community's openness and acceptance of people and animals and everything that that aren't perfect and are real and have sometimes some issues. I think in some ways, anti-marketing, um, anti-marketing works best, I will be honest, for cats, small dogs, and larger dogs that have issues like separation anxiety or destruction or something like that. Like, I don't know that I would try anti-marketing with a large dog that does have any sort of aggression issues. Um, but, you know, one of the other great things about anti-marketing is if you ask the general public that doesn't interact with shelters, they'll tell you that shelter people are very stern, um, anywhere from they put up stop signs to they're not honest about the animals, that sort of thing. And that breaks it all down. Like anti-marketing makes us conversational. It makes us friendly and it makes us honest, which is a really big thing. Cool, thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Lindsay. Lindsay, do you want to ask that question live? I just... My question was, when presenting the idea of anti-marketing, how do you deal with coworkers that want a more perfect presentation of your shelter to the public? Shelters aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. um, shelter marketing is different than regular marketing. And I, I definitely understand that when it comes to things like fundraising, particularly dealing with large donors, you really do want to have that very polished um, and, and very perfect sort of branding and presentation. But when it comes to marketing shelter animals, it's an entirely different animal <laughs> altogether because, um, you, you know, and this is something I've spoken with Kelly about a lot and it's an analogy I love is that if you're marketing a Cheeto, if you're marketing Cheetos, you can eat one Cheeto and market Cheetos to everybody. Cause you've had the Cheeto experience, right? Every Cheeto in that bag, that's going to be the same. But when you're marketing animals, you have to market the animals as individuals and you have to give them that dignity. Um, I definitely would. Again, it comes with using anti-marketing sparingly, but with your coworkers, I, I definitely would use, you know, talk to them about the fact we need to give this animal its dignity and we need to let people know that we know they're not perfect. We know their past pets haven't been perfect. And we know that you know, not every animal is perfect and we don't want people to think that every animal is perfect. So, I mean, I don't know if that helps at all, but it's just, it's shelter marketing is a really hard thing because you're juggling a lot of things. You're juggling fundraising, you're juggling different programs, and then you're also juggling um, marketing the individual animals. And when marketing the individual animals, individual animals require individual um, techniques. It's just a fact. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good point. And I put my email uh, in the chat. If anybody wants to reach out to me with anything, please feel free to. Um, Kelly has a question. I'm going to read your post to get started. Okay. Um, you wrote, we have two German Shepherds that are the last two left of a protective custody case that, that kept them in our care for two years. There are 27 German Shepherds total, and Foxy and Bibi are the last two. Foxy can't live with other animals, and Bibi has stranger reactivity. Both love and are much loved by the staff and volunteers, but we have tried just about everything to promote them. So the first thing I would ask with these dogs is for more, for more information about why, what does can't live with other animals look like? Like what has Foxy done in the past? Because I would definitely spell that out a little bit. Um, stranger reactivity provided that we're not talking of, like, are we just talking about barking? And, and I, can, I can see you, Kelly, you can nod. Are you, okay, cool. Um, Stranger danger. 
So it sounds, it, you know, it sounds like BB has a bad case of stranger danger and doesn't want other people up in her business, which is true of a lot of us, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so I would kind of, BB would be the much easier one, but I would go anti-marketing with both of these dogs. Um, possibly space, you would need to space them out a little bit. But I definitely would seed into these posts between the humor, the fact that sometimes life leaves you with scars, you know, sometimes you go through some stuff and it leaves you with some stuff. And unfortunately, you know, therapy can only take you so far. And at a certain point in time, you just need to live the way you need to live and, and kind of go that route. Cause I think a lot of people can relate to that. And I think that's probably very true for those two dogs as well you know yeah they've been they've been up for adoption since october because they were in protective custody for so long um and it's been in the news and everything so i think everyone that rushed in that wanted the dogs they all went quick so these are kind of now i think everyone's just seen them so much in our area as well too um german shepherd rescues are posting for us as well too sharing them um I would like to see the posts that are being shared for them. And if you would like to email them to me, I would be happy to over the weekend, take a look at them and make some suggestions. Um, You might also want to, where are you located, Kelly? I can hear you. In New Hampshire. Okay. Oh my God. You're in a fantastic market. There is a total, like there's not a lot of dogs up for adoption there. And there's a lot of people on farms. Like that's fantastic. Um, But yeah, you know, send me the marketing materials for them, but I definitely would expand their marketing if you're boosting posts to pretty much all of New Hampshire. Um, like, you know, kind of the northern Massachusetts, Vermont, like those kind of rural areas, that sort of thing. But everybody, particularly Vermont, you know, like Vermont knows therapy, you know, trust me. And like, like I know therapy, dude, you know, like it's not a big thing. But just making sure that, you know, people understand, like, you know, they've been through some stuff, and then they got stuck hung up for a couple of years, like, you know, well, all this got sorted out and that certainly didn't help. And I, I definitely think there's a way to make people empathize with them. And at the same time, like sort of lead with what they need, but not in such a way that you're screaming stop signs, but in a way that you're having people empathize with them. And Kelly, are they in foster right now? Um, BB has been in three different foster homes, um, where she's done well. Um, one of them was a staff member who her dog kept resource guarding and there were some scuffles that were started by the other dog. So it just wasn't safe to have BB there anymore. Um, another foster home has another dog and they would love to adopt her, but not both adults in the household are quite on board. So they're happy to foster her, um, here and there. Um, but they're, we're hoping that they make the decision to adopt her, but we don't want to put pressure on them. Um, and they can't foster her right now because of the COVID situation. So BB's at the shelter right now. Um, but we have limited staff that are there and it's actually been really nice because we had some new staff members that BB didn't know and BB successfully made friends with all of them during this time. So she's getting a lot of extra staff too. For me, BB, getting BB into a foster home right now would be a gimme just because so many people are stuck at home. Um, Like I was joking with Sheila and Kelly, like my husband and I are three bird feeders away and a hummingbird war in our backyard from going completely bonkers, you know. And not only are so many people stuck at home, but we're stuck at home without a lot of strangers coming into our homes. Exactly. Yes. And it's a really great time for people to bond and go slow. So this would be a great time to at least work on getting, try like experiment with an anti-marketing or a semi-anti-marketing campaign for BB to try to get her into a foster home. And Foxy, I think she's done an overnight once. Her, she's not 
dog reactive, but when she's been around other dogs, she has started some fights and she's gotten into some scuffles. So she's perfectly happy being an only dog, but that has been hard because a lot of people still want to try. And um, one of our really experienced staff members tried fostering her with her cats and she ended up having to bring Foxy back because the prey drive was just too much. Um, Sheila could probably speak more to this. Uh, but she'll probably, she'll, Sheila definitely could speak more to this than I can. Like, I'm just a person who writes stuff. But um, is Foxy gender specific with dogs? Like, my male dog can't handle other males, but he, he's fine with other females. Um, there was one male that she was able to be around. Um, we had a lot of, uh, we made a lot of play groups within the Shepherds. Um, and there was one really docile male that was great with all the, uh, all the females loved him. Um, he was adopted with another female. Um, so we haven't tried her with any, we had, we tried her with some of the other male shepherds and they were a little more active and she didn't do well with that. She loves to I play ball. She's, a, she's got like a one track mind where she will just play ball, play ball, play ball. <laughs> And I think it's important to think about and remember that she probably will never be good with smaller animals, but with animals that are bigger, how much of this is just the initial reactivity of forming a relationship with a new dog and she wants to be in control of everything. And if that she's with, matched with the right type of dog where introductions are done slowly, it might not go well, but there's also a chance that she's she's going to be perfectly fine but it, i mean you've already given me something like when you said she's got a one track mind and it's ball 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 there's somebody out there there's that would love that that would absolutely love that you know that just wants a dog to play fetch with and wants one dog um there's a lot of like single women who just want an active dog to play with and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, Foxy, Foxy, like, this is not Sheila behavior term at all. This is just an anti-marketing term. Like she's got some OCD issues and she's a bit possessive, <laughs> you know? So maybe like that sort of thing, just to try to put it in terms that people can understand like she just wants someone to throw the ball that will be hers and hers alone period we did a um a promotion during valentine's day where we did like dream jobs and celebrity person or whatever and for her her we had our dream job was the wimbledon ball girl <laughs> <laughs> she's got a big crush on serena williams yeah <laughs> awesome so I have one last question. When talking, we've done a decent amount of talking about introducing this concept to our organization to try it out. Are there any um, references, articles, anything like that that you recommend that would be good to share to teach people about it? Um, there's some really good, generally when I try to introduce this concept to um, shelters I, I there are some really good articles from respected marketing publications that are not shelter specific about specific campaigns and i can post those in this event um there's one from ann handley i think there's one from advertising weekly about these different campaigns and and for these specific animals so but because anti-marketing so many shelters have been a little hesitant to use it and because it is a fine line between throwing up stop signs and um genuinely creating a rapport and creating an emotional connection it's been a little bit difficult to do so there's not a lot of data on it yet but i i can kind of throw some articles in there about about different campaigns that have been done about different animals so all right. Well, I think we don't have any other questions. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And Finn, thank you so much. Um, this was super, super interesting. It was great to have you.
Yeah. Anytime. I'm so, so grateful to be here. So thank you all. And for all the foster people and all of the animal shelter people, thank you for all of the amazing work that you are doing under the most difficult of times and under the craziest of circumstances. You are all heroes and don't forget to honor yourself for that every night. Thanks everyone. Bye. Have a good night.